What I'm going to do, I'm going to address your church. And so for a few minutes, we're going to listen to him and see what he has to say. God bless you. And so I just felt to send this message to you just to challenge your church. And because when I was there the last time, I really felt the heaviness of the destiny of your church and what God has foreordained for your, you as a congregation and, and leadership of that church. And so as I send this message to you, I just want to challenge you to guard your hearts. This is a day when the enemy is sending confusion into many congregations I'm seeing it. I'm receiving phone calls from pastors all over the world that are telling me the same thing. And when I see that, I know that it is a organized front of the enemy. And I really believe it's because he knows that we are in the last days and that the church is seeing unprecedented harvest and revival. And so if it's not anything else he can do, he can try to stir us up against each other so that we're not able to be able to move function and be efficient in moving forward and doing what God wants us to do. So I challenge you to guard your hearts. Guard your hearts from thoughts and divisions and things that would prevent you from aligning yourself with the leadership of your church and aligning yourself with the things that God is wanting to do in your congregation. You know, I really believe that your church is a spiritual leader in your regional area. And that is why the enemy would want to try to stir up and, and divide you and to cause you to not be able to continue to do what you need to do. You know, we must understand that unless we're united, God can't use us. There has to be two things, and that is, number one, the spirit of unity, and number two, the unity of the spirit. Hmm. And the way that works, of course, is the spirit of unity is all of us coming together for the common purpose and the vision that God has called us to do. And then the spirit of unity is coming together with our leadership and the vision of the church and coming together in prayer. I really believe that if we will just concentrate on guarding our hearts in prayer, guarding our minds in prayer, guarding our eyes in prayer, then I really believe that this enemy's attack will bounce off of the armor of God that is upon us when we pray and that he will not succeed in what he's trying to do. And so guard your heart, guard your mind, guard your eyes from the things that the enemy would try to do to distract you and to offend you and to cause you to not function in unity. And then the next thing is the unity of the spirit. The only way we can have unity of the spirit is to have the spirit of unity. And once we have come together as one, then we join together with God as one. It's the body coming together in harmony so that it is healthy and strong and able to perform and then aligning itself with God himself in the spirit of unity and the unity of the spirit. So I just challenge all of you, give yourself to prayer. I know you just came out of a season of prayer and, and I actually asked Brother Betcher if he would do that in your church because I just feel so protective of what God wants to do in your church and in your congregation that we don't want to see that sidetracked or we don't want to see you distracted. And so I asked him to lead you in a time of prayer, leadership, and the church as well. And if we'll just continue to do that as a, as a good habit, <laughs> as a lifestyle, then we can put on the armor of God every morning and we can prevent the attack of the enemy that wants to divide us. Remember, as it is said, and it's not in the Bible, but it probably should be, united we stand, divided we fall. And we are united together for the common cause of what God desires to do in this last day, that we might see a harvest like we've never seen before, that we may focus on the harvest. When I was with you during the Passing the Mantle Conference, it was in one particular service that I was ministering that I perceived angels in the congregation. I later had two different people come to me and tell me that as you raised your right hands and began to worship and praise mm. God, God put a sickle in your hand. Mm. I don't believe that's accidental. 
I believe that that happened, and I believe it's because God has something very powerful in the destiny of your church. And I'm urging all of you to protect it in prayer, to protect your spirit, and to stay united. You are a great church. I have nothing to gain to say that except that it is a fact. It has been told to me in the spirit many times in prayer when I was praying over your pastor and his wife and family and, and your congregation. You are a great church. I'm so glad to be a part of whatever God is doing in your church. So glad that I can be a part of your leadership. And I just pray that God will bless you and prosper everything that you intend to do for his kingdom and that he will bless you in all that you put your hand to and pick up the sickle and go out into the harvest and let's harvest like we never have before because we know that our Lord Jesus Christ is coming soon and we must be ready. So reach out to every soul around you. Keep your focus on the harvest because there's just a small window of opportunity that we have to win them and then Jesus will carry us home. May the Lord bless you, keep you, may his face smile upon you. And I love you uh, as a church and I certainly love your pastor and his wife and family. I believe in you, and I believe you're going to do great things for God. God bless you. Praise God. <clears throat> it's so good to have a covering like that. He's praying for us, and he's, uh, I've kept him pretty busy lately, so uh, on the phone, just seeking direction, seeking, uh, seeking covering protection. It's a safe thing to have a leader like that, who prays and uh, uh, prays for the church and the people. Would you mind standing with me just for a moment? And I don't have to go very long. Because uh, Brother Williams almost preached the same message. I didn't tell him. Pretty soon I'm going to start telling those guys what to preach so they don't preach what I have to preach. Before we read in Judges chapter 6, let me just say thank you to the worship team, uh, all the hard work that you do behind the scenes. Thank you to the welcome team and the, uh, the usher team, the Sunday school, the youth, all the people, the sound technicians up there, everybody who's working behind the scenes to make us comfortable, to make us be able to enjoy the service. I don't say it often enough, but I just want to personally say thank you for the nursery and just all of the work that, that you do to make it easy for us just to come into a nice, cool place when it's 85 degrees outside and have a great service and feel the presence of God and this, the practice that goes on. I think we ought to put our hands together and just thank God for all the servants in this church. <clears throat> Judges chapter 6, verse 11, it says, And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash the Abizrite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. Verse 12 says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Please take a break for a moment and look at the picture of what's happening. You have a man that is threshing wheat by the wine press instead of out on a hill somewhere to catch the wind. Threshing wheat is to beat it and then throw it up in the air and let the wind take away the chaff so that the good seed falls to the ground so that they can gather it. That doesn't happen by a wine press very easily, much less in it. So when you're hiding from the enemy, here we have a man that's trying to eke out a living, trying to survive. And an angel of the Lord comes to him and says, thou mighty man of valor, the Lord is with thee, thou scaredy cat. He's hiding in a wine press, threshing out wheat, and the Lord calls him a mighty man of valor. I want to preach to you on the subject, just be yourself. Just be yourself. Brother Williams said, you need to figure out who you are. You need to know who you are in Christ, and I'm preaching on just be yourself. Let's pray. Jesus, 
we come into your presence again. This purpose, the word of God, we ask that your word of God would touch us, mold us, shape us, challenge us. God, let it chastise us even, giving us direction, following you, reaching for you. God, walking in your will. We pray that you would do that, Lord, and help us to see ourselves as you see us. We pray in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Look at your neighbor and smile at them and say, just be yourself. You may be seated. <clears throat> Thou mighty man of valor. God does some things sometimes that just make you scratch your head and wonder if he knows what he's doing. When I was reading that in my daily reading, I just I read across it and I thought, here's a guy that's hiding. Hiding from the enemy. Thou mighty man of valor. Just when you see contrasting, contrasting thought patterns like that, when one thing is said and another thing's happening, pay attention, something's about, something good's about to happen. Albert Einstein made a comment, and he said, the tragedy of life is what dies inside a man while he yet lives. The tragedy of life is what dies inside a man while he yet lives. My message is just be yourself. God looked at Gideon and he called him a mighty man of valor. Since God cannot lie, then Gideon must have been doing something or have become something that he really wasn't supposed to be. God saw him as a mighty man of valor and yet we would have seen him as a scaredy cat, as a coward, as somebody who is just accepting life the way it is. And yet God said, mighty man of valor. God might have well just said, Gideon, you need to be yourself. There is a place that I have called you to. It is a perfect plan, and you need to be who I called you to be. Hiding because of fear. If you think about what fear can do to somebody, Fear can cause us to try to accomplish a task in a very inconvenient way. Your struggles in life can sometimes be attached to the fact that you're not who God wants you to be. You're not who God made you to be. Why do I have all these struggles? Why do I have all these problems? Why am I not seeing all these miracles? It's because God intended you to be a mighty man of valor. That was the perfect plan. And now you're standing down in a wine press threshing wheat. That, that's who I am, God? What is God trying to say to you and to me this morning? The things that God is trying to call you is not necessarily even what he wants you to be. It's what he planned you to be. He planned for Gideon to be a mighty man of valor. See, he was not yet. It's because he was supposed to be, and he ended up not being. And God said, get back where I called you to be. Get back on top of the hill. Get back in the high place and thresh that wheat out in front of the enemy. Let him see you, because the Lord is with you. That's what he said. The Lord is with you. He didn't say you're on your own. He said the Lord is with you. The wind wasn't by the... Wine press. In fact, Meyer commentators say he was compelled to thresh his wheat in the wine press below the surface of the ground. And that's where many Christians live today, below the surface. I don't want anybody to see me. I want to just make it to heaven. I want to do my thing and make sure I get enough food for my family and maybe a little bit to sell so I can buy some leather for my feet to make shoes. I just, I just don't want to bother anybody. I just want to hide out and do my thing. And God says, get out of the wine press. That's for crushing grapes. He said, you're threshing wheat. That's for the high hill. Go up there where you're supposed to be. God is saying, what are you doing today in the wine press? It's time to go to the mountain. It's time for the world to see who you 
really are. Don't be afraid of what God has called you to be. Be yourself. Gideon, in verse 13, said unto him, Oh, my Lord. Some of us say that. Oh, my word. (laughs) Be with us. If the Lord be with us, please listen to this, this question that Gideon had. Why then is all this befallen us? If you're really with us, then what am I doing here? Maybe we should ask ourselves that question. If the Lord is really with us, what are we doing here? What are we standing in the middle of a, in the middle of a, 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 a wine press when we should be on the mountain? He said this, why are we in so much trouble? And where be all his miracles? That is a good question. If the Lord be with us. In other words, Gideon was expecting. He said, if the Lord is with us, we need victory and we need power and miracles. If you're really with us, that's what I'm expecting. And then he goes on to say, which our fathers told us of. Right, baby dedication? Passed down. Hey, by the way, God parted the Red Sea. By the way, God took control of Pharaoh and the whole kingdom. God did. God gave us bread in the wilderness. God gave us quail. God gave us water out of a rock. These are the things that God did. And now you have the next generation and they go, really? Man, I'd sure like to see some of that stuff. Where are you? What are you doing? You're standing in a wine press. You're saying the enemy has overtaken us and now we're down in a wine press trying to get the chaff to separate from the wheat and God is saying, get out of there. You want to see the miracle signs and wonders? You want to believe that my power is with you? Go up on the mountain. Let the world see what apostolic really is. Let them see what prayer is. Let them see what the power of Pentecost really is. Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt, but now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Why do bad things happen? Where are the miracles? Generations before told me of deliverance from Egypt, and I'm just not sure this happens anymore, and we're beaten down. That's the message. Verse 14, the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? Now hold on a minute. I'm standing in the middle. I'm hiding. I'm hiding out in a wine press. And God said, go in this thy might. He didn't say go in my might. (laughs) I like reading the way it's written. Too many people put words in there that aren't in there. I'd rather read it the way it is. He said, go in this thy might. You're powerful. You're victorious. You have miracles in your hands if you lay them on people. Thy shall lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. Miracles will happen. You have faith. You have power. You have all, everything that you need to accomplish. You see what God is saying? Go in this thy might and you're going to deliver Israel. God, do I need to clean your glasses? I'm standing in a wine press, hiding from the enemy, hoping they won't take away the, the wheat that I've threshed. 15, and then he said unto him, Oh, my Lord, wherewith shall I say, save Israel? How am I going to do that? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in thy father's house. Clark reads it, The thousands in Manasseh are thinned. This has nothing to do with their weight. Maybe because they might be starving. He means our, the, the, the tribes are diminished. A lot of them are wiped out, died. He said, the tribe is greatly reduced and can do little against their enemies. But notice, God said, go in this thy might and you will deliver Israel. You will deliver Israel. And then immediately Gideon says, um, I'm from the tribe of Manasseh. You obviously have made a mistake. Not only that, You know, Manasseh has been reduced in size, but I'm the least in my father's house. So not only did you get the tribe wrong, you got the guy wrong. I'm like, I'm the runt of the family. That's what many of the commentators said. He goes, I'm the little guy. You should see my brother. 
We have a tendency when God says, I want you to be who you are. Just be who you are. What do we say? God, you, you must have made a mistake. Because I lied. I stole. God, I did drugs. God, immoral in my life. God, I, you, you, you obviously had the wrong guy. There are people that are pastor's kids somewhere. They're the choice of the, man, they're, they're way up there. Why don't you choose them? You don't understand. I made mistakes. I have failures. I have faults in my life. You must have made a mistake. That's what happens to every one of us when God says, I want you to do this. And we say, you must. God, I'm, I'm, I'm from such and such a family. And not only that, but I'm the runt. Immediately we focus in. God says, you don't understand. You're looking at yourself the way you see it, as a failure, as, a, as faults, as wrinkle and blemishes in your life. I see you as a mighty man of valor. That's what I see when I look at you. Be who you are. Just be who you are. Woo! God, Gideon then described himself I like what you're saying, but there's an obstacle. You got the wrong guy. There's others far more qualified. 16 says, And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midians as one man. Clark says, Thou shalt surely conquer all their host, as if thou hadst but one man to contend with. He said, I know Midian, or, or, or Manasseh is looking at Midian. They're like, there's, there's no way we can do that. What God said is, I'm going to make it as if you're fighting one man. I'm going to make it like, it, if you look at Midian, or would you feel a little better about it if I just had one man? God was saying, the size of your opposition makes no difference. I'll make it like you only have one man to contend with. But notice God said, I'm not going to take the fight away completely, but I'll make it winnable. I'll make it winnable. You're going to be able to fight like you're going against one man. Could I be so bold as to say God would make it like fighting one man, but our greatest battle will be one man. God didn't even say it would be a Midianite. Our greatest battle may be the person in the mirror. What happened to Israel when they went as spies into the land? We see ourselves as grasshoppers. God's like, it don't matter who you are. This is how I see you. If we can beat this guy right here and say, I'm not going to see myself as a sinner, failure, Flawed. I'm going to see myself as a mighty man of valor because the Lord is with me. That's what he said. I'm going to be with you and you. <laughs> Maxwell said, vision without cost is just a daydream. God, I want to do something for you. And I have a great vision of what is in vision without cost is a daydream. He built an altar and offered a sacrifice to the Lord, but the Lord told him also to tear down the altar of Baal, cut down the grove, build another altar, and offer another sacrifice in the high place. The Lord, living for God, is more than just building an altar. It's also tearing down some altars. There's some things we, we come into the church and we say, I just want to build an altar, a fresh altar unto God. That's awesome. But God is saying, you know what? I see too many altars around here. You need to tear down some. Don't just build a new one. Because what? Old things are passed away. All things are made. Tear down the altar and cut down the groves. Tear down the idols and cut down the things that have grown unto a false god. Cut them down. Living for God is not just building an altar. It's tearing some things down. Midianites gathered together with the Amalekites, the children of the east. It says all of them gathered together. But then it says in verse 34, it says, but the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. All the enemies started to come, started to gather against. And the Bible says the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. And it says he blew a trumpet. 
<laughs> didn't sound like he ran to the wine press. Oh, <gasps> here they come. Didn't do that. This time, after talking with the Lord, he was convinced, here comes the enemy. And he goes, I'm not hiding anymore because God said, I'm a mighty man of valor. When the spirit of the Lord comes upon you, you're not supposed to hide. You're supposed to go up to the mountain and say, I'm here to fight. I'm here to stand up for what's right. I am a mighty man. I'm a mighty woman of prayer. Who are you today? Just be yourself. Don't let the world put you in a mold. Notice after he did that, one chapter later in Judges 7, the Bible says, and 300 blew their trumpets. How many people are waiting for one person to stand up and say, God has got me convinced. I'm a mighty man of valor, and I blow the trumpet. Next thing you know, there are 300 people that blow their trumpet. It is contagious. People, what's he doing up there? Doesn't he know the enemy's going to see him? Well, yeah, but God is with him. So we're going to blow our trumpets too. And they blew their trumpet. And what happened? The enemy turned their swords on each other, started fighting each other. They didn't even fight for a while. And he ended up having 120,000 people fall that day of the enemy. Why? Because one man listened to God and said, I am, a, I am not a coward. I'm a mighty man of valor. And I'm going to stand up for what I believe in. Two minutes. Paul said in 2 Timothy, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. My course. God called me to something. Am I myself? Am I being myself? Or am I letting you make me something else? There is a huge compromising problem today is my influence of you. Here's what I want to make you. We need to say, no, I want God to make me. I want God to reveal to me who I am. Don't let anybody influence for bad. Let God say, let me tell you who you are. You're not a liar. You're a prince in power with God. That's who you are. You are blessings of God. That's who you are. Let me tell you who you are. Not the world. Don't adjust to their pressure even when they're hanging their check over your head. I live for God. This is who I am. And this is who I'm going to be. Rabbi Zuzia made this comment so powerful. He said, in the world to come, I shall not be asked, why were you not Moses? I shall be asked, why were you not Zuzia? We spend too much time trying to be somebody else. Trying to let the world dictate what we look like, where we go. What we do, what our activities are, don't listen to them because God is not going to compare you to me. He's not going to compare me to Pastor Yance or to Pastor Dobbs. He's going to compare me to what I was supposed to be. That's what God is, God is going to say, this was my plan for your life. You are a mighty man of valor. Get out of the wine press and take the stuff to the mountain and blow the trumpet and say this, but I'm a backslider. I'm not living for God. I'm, 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 I'm afraid of what God will do if I come back. You need to be yourself. You need to say, who cares what the church says? Who cares what the big brother says? I'm coming home. I'm coming home because I want to be myself. Please stand with me. God's perfect plan, like Gideon, includes his spirit upon us. Ezekiel said it includes a new heart and a new spirit. We can't be ourselves. What does that tell me? If Ezekiel prophesied and said, a new heart and a new spirit will I put in you. That means that the one that we have is not what we're supposed to be. He's saying you can't be 
yourself until you let me make you what you were supposed to be. Adam in the garden before sin was the perfect self. He's the one that changed it by sin. Sin took Adam away from himself. But to be restored is to put that spirit of God back in so that I can be myself. I'm not complete. It wasn't my wife as much as I love her. But it wasn't her that made me complete. It was him. My heart was empty without him. If you look at the, the daunting task, what is it that you want me to be? Or what am I supposed to Who am I, Jesus? Let him tell you. And those shackles of cowardice will fall off. Let me tell you something, Peter. You're not in prison. Sure looks like it to me. Doors open up. And he walks, he goes, you're free. Man can't stop you. He can't stop me from making you who I know you are. You are a free man. Now get up. He, it says he smote him in the side. Hey, get up. Get out of here. Just follow me. That's who you are. Who are you today? What are you afraid of? What is stopping you from really being yourself? What's stopping you from stepping into the anointing that God has for? What are you afraid of? Why are you standing down below ground in the wine press? Instead of stepping out and saying, God, talk to me. I haven't seen the miracles that I want to see. I haven't. Why are we in so much trouble? Why does it seem that the church is struggling with attacks? Why is that? It's because you view yourself differently than what you're supposed to be. See, the true church is without spot and blemish. We have some work to do right? But see, God doesn't see us that way. God says, this is what you're trying. We are becoming that. We are becoming an apostolic, a powerful bride of Christ. That's what we're trying to do. But we need his power and his direction and his word in our lives. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? Jesus. Oh. Jesus, thank you, Lord. 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 James McIntosh said, it is right to be contented with what we have, never with what we are. We are supposed to be content with what God has provided, but not with who we are. Because John said, I must decrease and he must increase. That means we must we must struggle and press to be more like him. Jesus, we've heard your voice in multiple ways today, and we pray that you would help us not to be stuck in tradition. God, we can't continue to do everything that we've been and done. We have to, God, take off the shackles of who we were and become who we are. Lord, there are things that are beneath the surface that want to come out. God, there are things that you have for us. There are things that you have called us to do. 
people have been feeling it. They've been voicing it. There's something going on. There's something inside of me. God, help me to peel away the facade of who this world has made me and who the failures and flaws have made me. But help me to become the mighty man of valor or mighty woman of valor in prayer and power and intercessor. God, that's what we need to become. Lord, would you give me the faith? Give me the courage to step out of the lower places and step into the higher places to allow you to to help me to become who I really am. Help me to be who I am in you, Jesus. I pray for this. You can't do that without the power. If you'd like to come forward, I'm, I'm asking you today, just come up to the altar for a moment. And all I'm asking you to do is say, God, remove my perception of who I am. Just remove it. I've been with me for 57 years. I know who I am. Oh, please don't do that. Please say, God, I have lived 57 years and I'm still not who I am. I'm trying to be who you called. Help me to realize and to achieve who I really am. Help me to do that, Jesus. Let your power come upon these people. Let your word come upon these people. Let your spirit, the spirit of the Lord be upon them. The spirit of the Lord be upon them. Jesus, peel back the confusion. God, the scales from their eyes that stop them from seeing. We look in a mirror and we don't see who we are. We see what the world and our failures have made us. It's our perception. God, I call myself the least of my father's house, but you call me a mighty man of valor. Oh, what a step. What an incredible, God, divide there is between who I see myself and who you see me as. Help me, Jesus, to cross that great divide and to become not what the world declares me to be. Take away their influence. Take away their pressure and infuse the pressure of the Holy Ghost. Lead me into that place that will let me be who I really am. There is a perfect plan in my life. If I will put my feet, the Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered, not redirected. There is an order. God is a God of order. Lord, order my footsteps. Let them walk directly in the path that you've called me. Jesus, I want to be who you made me to be. Help me, Lord, to lay aside every weight and the sin that doth so easily beset me, the things that this world has made me, and let me run with patience the race, the course that is set before me. I receive that today, Jesus. I receive power from you. I receive anointing from you. I receive clarity. I receive your voice today. I receive your direction. I receive your compassion and protection and love upon me and my family. I receive, I receive what you call me. I receive, I receive it, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, let the Holy Ghost, let the Spirit of Jesus Christ come, fill and control, energize and restore. Let it come. That's it. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Jesus. Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus.